Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 473rd New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Byron Kim and Amanda Gluvitzi. We're thrilled to welcome the poet Shang Young Fong here, who will close out today's program with a reading. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoping, the unceded land and waters of the Wapinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a second. But now to, to introduce today's guest and host, artist Byron Kim works in an area one might call the abstract sublime. His work sits at the threshold between abstraction and representation, between conceptualism and pure painting. In his richly hued minimalist works, Kim seeks to push the edges of what we understand as abstract painting by using the medium to develop an idea that typically gets worked out over the course of an ongoing series. Kim lives and works in Brooklyn, New York and San Diego, California, and is a senior critic at Yale University. Kim's current exhibition is open at James Cohen, and we will post a link to that in just a moment in the chat. Our host today, formerly Associate Professor at Ohio State University, Amanda Gluibitzi is the founding co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and is an art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. She specializes in mid and late 20th century art design and urbanism in the United States, Europe, and Latin America. Amanda is the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York from Anthem Press. And without further ado, Amanda, passing you the mic. Great, thank you so much, Nick. And thank you all of you for being with us today. This is a really, really excitingly large crowd. So now I'm nervous, but um, I think we'll get, we'll get over it. And um, thank you, Byron, for joining us today. Um, Nick's going to start showing you some images of Byron's current show at James Cohan. And if you're in the New York area and haven't been yet, please, please go see this show. Um, I described it on Instagram as luscious, and I stand by that. So Byron, I'm going to get right into asking you some questions first about these, these paintings that you're displaying right now. Um, you made them at a residency at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation property on Captiva Island. And um, I was kind of curious about that setting specifically, because you live in New York and San Diego, which are two cities that have a certain amount of water presence, um, certainly San Diego in a different way from New York, but they are both maritime cities. So what was it about being on Captiva Island that made you start to think about your relationship with water and, and with large bodies of water? Um, actually, it's true that the, well, first I wanted to just thank you, Amanda, Nick, and, and Fong for, um, for inviting me. Um, really happy to be here. Um, the the idea for these paintings started in Captiva and the, the the paintings in the show I I actually made in both Norfolk, Connecticut, um, Gowanus in Brooklyn, and in La Jolla, California. So these particular paintings I didn't make in Florida. Okay. But the reason why the reason that I mean, I think the reason why it, the notion of these paintings started in Florida is during that residency, I was spending a fair bit of time on the water in kayaks and on a paddleboard. And so I was observing the surface of the water a lot. And so the middle panels of all these paintings have something to do with the surface of the water. Um, and sometimes thinking of these various places, but um, often just kind of conjuring them um, in my mind, um, especially in the case that uh, if it's a painting, like there's a painting in the show that's, um, whose subject matter is Solaris, which is, so you see that on the right and in the image that's, that's showing right now. Um, so that's just 
my interpretation of Stanislav Lem, Stanislav Lem's description of the the planet, um, an imaginary planet, which is covered by ocean, by an ocean that is sentient. Um, you mentioned that there are three parts to each painting. And I think that we can see that in the images, but um, what viewers may not be aware of if they haven't been to the show is that what we're looking at is actually three separate pieces that combine to develop a single image. And so I was curious about that. Um, are they meant to be three separate paintings? Are they meant to be a triptych um, that then develop a single visuality? How do you envision these three panels working together? I think of them as the latter, as a, as a triptych. Um, the, actually, I've been thinking of making this kind of painting for probably a couple decades. And these aren't exactly what I had envisioned way back then. What I, what, what I thought of way back then were simply um, panels that are separate, that connect, and whose painting um, mode is, is very different from panel to panel. Um, so there might be one painting in the show that starts to approach what I was thinking way back then, because um, I wasn't necessarily thinking about water. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, the consistent theme in this, in the works in this show are, are a little bit counter to that original idea because I, I thought of having um, panels whose content were connected um, um, sort of thematically, but not visually. So abrupt changes between the panels visually. Um, and that happens a bit in this, sh in the paintings in the show, but mostly I'm trying to make them um, work with each other, the, the panels in the triptych. Um, even though there is literally a separation between mm -hmm. the panels. Um, one other thing that's related that, that in, in, in answer to your question is that um, I wanted the freedom. Um, um, so if you stop on this image, um, the, 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 the work that's on the left is so the, the top uh, in in all of these triptychs the top has to do with the sky the middle has to do with the surface of water and the bottom has to do with um underneath you know uh underwater and this in this particular um image which is titled after really only titled after the middle panel um, I'm singling it out because it's the one, the one work in the show that was clearly swapped out. In other words, I mean, I guess the, the, the most concise way I could put it is that the middle panel has to do with choppy ocean water swimming, open water swimming in La Jolla. And then the bottom has to do with, um, it's, it's a pond, it's the palette of a pond um, called Toby Pond um, in, in Norfolk, Connecticut. It's like the underwater palette. Um, so those don't really have anything, have that much to do with each other, but um, in an act of desperation, which, which will often happen eventually um, in my studio, um, I just had to swap them out and try to make them work. What told you that you that you had to swap them out and make them work? I'm always curious about this. How did you know? How did you know where to go? It's always something like this, Amanda. It's always that I walk into my studio and I go, "Oh shit, this this is all terrible. Nothing is good." 
um, I, all, I only want to come to my studio and make a good painting. And all, whatever, nine of these paintings are shitty. So what can I do? Um, well, I left myself this kind of like um, escape valve of being able to <laughs> swap things around and maybe 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 they'll start to work better and and that's what happened um in in a, in a moment of despair you just start grasping at straws and something 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 catches with that particular painting you mentioned that <laughs> The middle panel is La Jolla, but the bottom panel is Connecticut. Is that true of the paintings across the board that you're kind of mixing and matching the, the different locales or do some of them have all one, one scene? Most of them have one scene. Most of them are fairly consistent. Um, the, the thing about talking about them in this way that's a little bit misleading is that um, the scene is mostly in my mind. Um, in, in the case of a couple of them, the scene is aided by a snapshot on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I try not to rely too much on that sort of thing. And um, so it's just trying to make the painting um, look like something that I have in mind. I don't know if that fully answered your question. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it does a little bit. I guess one of the, the questions I have is, um, this is actually a really good slide to stop on. We wind up having to stand in front of these paintings um, because that's how we look at paintings. But if we're both in the water in the middle panel and under the water in the lower panel and above the water looking at the sky in the top panel, then we're also kind of amorphously floating within and back and forth and over and under the paintings. And so how, how do you see us um, using these images for lack of a better word? That's a really qu a good question that I'm, I'm fairly unprepared to answer, but I'll try it. Try I wasn't it. prepared to ask it, so. <laughs> yeah, that, those are the best questions and answers, I think, usually. Um, so um, the people, some people at the gallery at Cohan, when we were going back and forth about how this work should be talked about, you know, that often happens in the in the in the process of trying to formulate a press release, whatever that is. Um, some people started thinking of these as portraits because I've done something that people have thought of as portraits in the past although they're hardly ever, they, they are hardly ever conventional portraits. Anyway, when that notion arose a couple months ago, I, I didn't reject it, but I didn't feel very close to it at all. I didn't think of them as portraits, but then once I was sort of forced to, I realized maybe there's the self portrait Maybe they're that maybe they are self portraits of a swimmer, um, because really all the sort of experiential knowledge that I gained in order to make these paintings had to do with swimming, and and very literally the format of these paintings have to do with doing the breaststroke. Yeah. So because in the breaststroke. I mean, the breaststroke isn't the perfect stroke for looking at the sky. I think freestyle is better for that or backstroke, but um, the breaststroke is the best stroke for observing all three of these zones, or, or maybe the better way of putting it is that 
while doing the breaststroke in these various bo bodies of water, I realized that there were three zones, the underwater, the surface of the water and the sky. Um, so as you, as you take your position in front of the painting as a viewer, um, in, in front of these particular paintings, you're sort of analogizing yourself to a swimmer. There. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, the first time I've articulated that that way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, it's it's funny because as I was walking through the show, I kept thinking about Jasper Johns's diver for some reason. Oh. Um, and of course, it's not a swimmer, right? But it is a person who could be about to swim. Um, and uh, now I know why, which is so interesting to me. I've also, when I've taught, described certain, especially Jackson Pollock paintings as paintings that are so big that you could just like allow yourself to fall face forward right into them. And then you would be totally submerged in this, this uh, aqueous oil environment um, that, that Pollock has created for you. And so as you were speaking that, I was also thinking about these, these art historical reference for myself. Yeah, um, I those those are those are good references for me. Um, I try to make these paintings. I mean, simply put, I try to make these paintings that size, um, and so they're they are six feet wide and nearly nine feet high. Um, they were a little big to paint um, with acrylic. I think they wouldn't have been so bad had I um, painted them in oil, which I, th I think ideally I, I would have liked to have painted them in oil. It just takes much longer and mm. I didn't have the luxury of being able to do that. Um, maybe partly because um, I know that I'm prone to procrastinating. Um, so I wouldn't try to set myself up with that kind of problem. Um, I, wa I'm, I wanna make more of them and I'm thinking of making them slightly smaller because it was difficult with acrylic to make them this wide. So instead of six feet, I think I'm gonna try five feet. Uh, it is true that some of them, um, it seems like you used a lot of medium or something. And so they're, they're very aqueous, actually. They, they have this wonderful fluidity to the panels. And then others, we can really see the brush strokes. You know, you're moving. Um, I don't know if you're left-handed or right-handed. I'm left-handed. So I'm, I'm making this left to right movement, but perhaps you're moving in the opposite direction. Yeah, it's I'm right handed, but it is left to right, uh, usually, for some reason, it's like a backhanded stroke. I don't know why mm. I, ne I never thought about that. Um, and the reason why acrylic uh, is more difficult is simply that it, I mean, you, you kind of implied it just now, it, it dries. Mm -hmm much faster and and so I need to get enough medium in it so that it has um, structural surface integrity but um, but enough water in it so that it'll flow and that's really hard to do um, I, yeah they're different they're different um, mediums that you can use to 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 make that easier, but nothing says, nothing in acrylic is as greasy as oil. Um, so um, I, I really want to make oil paintings again, but I don't know when that's going to happen. I actually, I kind of have an idea for some works that will, once I'm done with these, that <coughs> will, will, will kind of have to be um, made with oil paint. Anyway, I'm just meandering now. Now I'm like, ooh, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I, I probably should. I, okay. I, yeah, I don't, I'm only, he, I'm mostly hesitating because I know I'll jinx it if I, <laughs> if I let it out. I don't want you to jinx it. <laughs> um, let me ask you, Nick, I'm going to ask you to stay on this painting because I have tons of questions about it. But something that you said, Byron, made me just think, um, you know, you were, there, your relationship to water as you're swimming through it. And I'm sure that we're all noticing that you wear glasses. And so are, do you have um, prescription goggles or are you actually kind of making your way through this water and this, this um, marine environment somewhat unable to see what's happening? And so it's actually this like full um, experience for you then. So all of the above, I, I had prescription goggles, which I lost because um, you shouldn't, I always get, seduced when the waves are better to body surf and I'm sometimes lazy to go bring my gear to the beach so I lost my prescription goggles body surfing I actually lost my main pair of glasses in the pond in Connecticut because I stupidly thought that I needed an iPhone shot of the surface of the water one day and I swam out there and luckily I swam out there with a friend, Mitch, who um, basically saved my iPhone. I think that, I don't think I would have drowned because I would have eventually thrown my iPhone in the water, but I realized it was way more difficult to tread water and get a good shot of the water. Um, this is way too much detail, too much information, no. but I no, had my glasses, <laughs> I had my glasses were more like, which were more like these, which were exactly like these, but were the, the kind that change color, uh, like turn into sunglasses. And I had them propped on top of my head while I was treading water and I was just exhausted and I hadn't gotten the right shot. And so I dunked under while holding my iPhone in the air. And then I came up without my glasses. Um, I, I often wear this, so the best solution has been wearing my, my dive mask, my snorkel mask with contact lenses. Mm. And then of course, lots of times I go out with just swim goggles and that are not prescription and without glasses. And yeah, everything's all blurry, um, but that can be good. Actually, that can be even more informative because I sometimes I don't want to see too much detail. I just want to see what the color is and what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that we're on this slide or this work because these aren't at all the, this painting isn't all at all the musing of a swimmer it's 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 the it's the it's supposed to be um the the quite quite in, imperiled or or perilous um uh, moment that a cosmonaut on solaris is trying to make his way in his space pod through the soupy sticky atmosphere of Solaris, which is con apparently contiguous with the ocean's consistency of the, like the ocean and the atmosphere are both very sticky, I think. Mm -hmm. And so it's nothing like earth. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that this painting captures it that well. It's in the end, all I'm trying to do is make a good painting. So it does, once I start to make a good painting and it departs from the content, that's fine. Um, Cause the, 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 like I keep saying, the objective is to make a, a painting, um, not, to, not to accurately depict something. Mm -hmm. With this painting, um... 
since it's named Solaris, I think it's kind of inevitable then that your your viewer, if we're paying attention to, you know, the, the gallery printout or if it, there's a wall tag nearby or even looking at the slide right now, um, we're going to see it and we're going to start to think about its relationship to that text. Um, and so that brings up a question for me about these three texts that you read while you were at the Rauschenberg Foundation. <clears throat> Obviously Solaris, but also Moby Dick and then the Odyssey. And um, I was curious about, first of all, why those three? I think uh, there's an obvious answer, but I, I'm, I'm assuming there are some unobvious answers too. But also I'm, I'm kind of curious about your interest in the idea of a sentient body of water, which I think all three texts could be argued do explore. Um, yeah, one of the unobvious answers to your question is a simple one, and that's that um, those are three texts that I had already read. Um, I, I have a very, I've only realized this recently, I have a very difficult relationship to reading. And I, I think I didn't realize this growing up, but I think I have, because I, I don't even know if the term existed, but I think I have um, attention like pretty serious attention issues. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I actually don't, how am I, what am I saying? I don't, I don't, I often don't get that much out of a book unless I've read it a bunch of times, simply. So, um, that was the third time I'd read Solaris. Um, also the third time I had read Moby Dick um, over many, many years. And, um, and then the Odyssey, I, I don't know how many times I've read it because I, I seldom have read it like all the way through. Um, and in fact, I haven't finished reading um, the Odyssey after having picked up a, a new translation um, during that residency. I'm kind of, I keep like starting again and getting halfway through. Um, so yeah, I just, I just noticed that Patricia in the chat had said that they're all, they're all journeys. So yeah, they're, they're all, they're all they're definitely all stories of journeys on the water. Um, and I mean, Solaris isn't, Solaris isn't really that. It's, it's definitely a journey story. Um, um, and what else can I say? Um, I took, I, the, the series title, um, it, it picks out three, it picks out one character from each of the works of the works of literature, and um, Odysseus is an obvious one for um, for the Odyssey. Although I, I I started to scour it later on to try to find a different character because that one is so obvious, um, and I I ended up not looking too hard just because it would have just been um, difficult and messy to change the, it was a working, BQO was a working title, I thought, and then it just got, after time, it sort of got ensconced. So it would have been difficult to change. Um, I mean, Burton and Queequeg are, um, they're such interesting characters because they're neither of them are the main character certainly, but they're they're like in some ways the main journeyers, um, and 
that neither of them survive. I mean, Burton sur literally survives. Queequeg, unfortunately, doesn't. But Burton doesn't survive his trip to Solaris and back um, in a very good psychological state. Um, so um, these these consequential journeys really affect the character and, and affect us. And, and, you know, swimming in the open ocean is very affecting. Um, I've only, I've only started to do it. I only took it up as a, as a endeavor during this, um, period during this pandemic period. And, um, my partner, Lisa, who is also an artist, um, and um, we, we, we started doing it together in La Jolla. There's a particular, a particular swim that's <clears throat> exactly a mile from one beach, um, from the beach that I kind of grew up on to uh, this cove. Um, and the latter part of the swim is over incredibly deep water. Um, and um, yeah, it's the, the, the experience of being in the water can change so rapidly, even if there is no apparent um, even if there's no apparent change in the immediate environment. Mm -hmm. So an example of that is that one time we were swimming in this this guy comes in a bo boat right for me and Lisa's always ahead of me because of my, because of my attention issues I'm like always thinking of other things and even though I have fins on Lisa is always a good 20 yards ahead of me and this guy is paddling towards me and usually small boats are trying to avoid swimmers, but I could tell this guy's coming right at me on purpose to tell me something. So I stopped and he said, I just wanted to let you know that I, saw, I just saw, I just saw a great white. And I, I said, oh, oh really? I was very skeptical because there aren't that many great white sight sightings in, the, in those waters, although there are more now, um, I think because of climate change. And, um, and I, I asked him how big it was because I knew there had been juvenile ones sighted and they're not that, they're not nearly as dangerous as an adult. And uh, he said, it was big, it was, it was over 20 feet, which made me a little bit more skeptical. Um, but, and now I'm feeling really bad for bringing up great white sharks uh, first off, because sharks are so maligned and, and it's only that species that's dangerous um, to us. Um, I mean, the other, you know, we go and try to find leopard sharks um, and um, the other sharks are really fun to go find. Um, so, well, there was there was actually a, a great white shark eating in Southern California over the the Christmas holiday. So, I'm really glad that guy told you. <laughs> yeah, well, Lisa was ahead of me, and and when I caught up to her, so I, I I felt motivated to catch up to her. And she her the the first thing she said because she she didn't have this encounter with the guy, she said. Um, let's go all the way to the cove today. And that's where all the seals and sea lions are. So I had to like convince her to come back without telling her why we needed to go back. And um, I guess the main point of my telling you that anecdote is that things just changed so much, even though I'm not particularly worried. Um, I just, you know, I put my head under and I didn't see anything unusual. Um, but part of my mind expected to see something very unusual. Um, yeah. 
but you see unusual things once in a while in the water. Um, once two dolphins swam, they could have, there weren't, there were hardly any people in the water and they swam right under me so close that I could have touched their dorsal fin. And they were obviously having a little joke with me. Um, and I just, I didn't see them coming. So I was very surprised and I just kind of, you know, stuck my head out of the water really quickly and, and faced their direction, which was perpendicular to my swim. And um, I could hear once they surfaced about, I don't know, some yards past me, um, I could hear their chattering. So I just imagined them like making fun of me. <laughs> swimming. <laughs> If the ocean is sentient, it's making fun of us. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hope, let's hope it's, let's hope that that's all it's doing. Because <laughs> Solaris's ocean is much less benign. And on that subject, you know, the, the, the ocean is definitely changing because of us. But it's very subtle, um, according to my, you know, my observations from swimming but it's real mm -hmm. and um I, I don't know how it's going to end up i feel confident that the oceans will be fine um after we're done um because there'll be some other equilibrium reached when we think about Solaris and the way that the the ocean kind of acts on the characters in the book and acts as a character in the book, I, I want to say too. Um, I think we really see that turbulence in the very red Solaris painting that we were looking at before. But mm -hmm. when I when I looked at that in the gallery, I, I wasn't carrying the galleries um, sheet with me. I was just looking at the painting. But I knew that you had read these three books. And so I was actually thinking about the the line from the Iliad and Odyssey about the wine dark sea. Oh, and right. so I was curious about that too, about are there elements of the text that you're reading um, of, of the language or of the poetry of them that you feel you're you're attempting to infuse the paintings with? Um, wow, that is such a great question, because it makes me realize that it makes me realize all at once that that painting could have been a an ancient Greek depiction, like my version of that. Um, and it's because we we all see color in our own way. And so different cultures see color differently. And um, maybe it would have been, that is such a great question because I'm thinking maybe it would have been or could be very interesting to depict, to try to depict. Yeah, in a certain way, like, trying to depict the color of the environment on Solaris is a little bit like depicting the way in which another culture perceives color because the other culture in this case is a sentient planet. Um, and um, I don't think I can answer that question fully, except to say that it makes me think that some more of these paintings could be that much more um, imagined or um, in relation to uh,
what I wonder what the opposite of projection is. Like if I if I'm not that I'm trying to not that I like inevitably we end up placing our own um, ways of seeing things onto something else or someone else, but like the attempt to does it have something to do with empathy? Um, mm. The attempt to see things through someone else's eyes. Um, that might be an interesting way of approaching it. So really, I think that's a really wonderful way of describing actually so many of your projects, truthfully, um, is, is a, an attempt actually to place yourself into someone else's eyes and to then start to see through them in order to make paintings. I think that's a really, really fascinating descriptor. Thanks, yeah. Um... I, I guess I'm always trying to do that, like see, see things how I see it and how, how someone else might see it too. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, it's a very intimate proposition because it's hard for me to imagine like I mean, I just mentioned like how a planet might see it, but I, I don't think I can imagine how, I, I can start to imagine how, you know, if I knew you well, how you might see something, but um, it would be hard for me to, and very presumptuous of me to try to envision what like some, group of people the way they might see something i don't know that i just started to feel like i was getting into some uh choppy waters there <laughs> i mean i i guess it could be presumptuous but it could also be generous right maybe yeah one of the paintings mean, i'm sorry please go ahead oh you mean in terms of like just in the sense of kind of the desire to initiate a conversation. Mm. Is that what you meant, kind of? Yeah, I, and I think also, you know, we, we talk about this, I guess, like when we have, you know, when we have fights with our friends or our partners or our siblings or something, you know, and we say like, why can't you see it through my perspective, right? Um, yeah. And I, so I'm wondering, you know, if there isn't a generosity then, um, you know, Yes, I think the flip side could be that it is presumptuous to assume we can. Oh, I um, see what you're saying. Yeah, it is generous. It's hard to be generous sometimes in that way. Yeah. Because in the end, you can only see it the way you see it. <laughs> it's true. I think that I think that all the time, of course, um, you know, obviously as a person who writes art criticism, but also as a person who edits art criticism. It's very tricky sometimes to to recognize that one has to step back and and you know take your hands off of the page um, because it's not your writing. It's somebody else's writing and you're attempting to to see things through their eyes. Right. One of the paintings that I really thought about when I was standing in the gallery, um, there, there are lots of things that were running through my mind. Obviously, I've already said like Jasper Johns's Diver, um, obviously like a Mark Rothko painting. Um, when I realized that the paintings were panels placed together, I started thinking about someone like Blinky Palermo, um, whose, whose uh, multi-panel paintings are actually placed together. Um, but the, the artist I was really thinking about was Caspar David Friedrich. Um, and, and one painting in particular, which Nick is at the very end, there it is, um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, because it has three zones. Um, you know, we have the, the beach, we have the water, and then we have the sky. 
Um, so not exactly the three zones of your paintings, but something, something that's working in a similar way. But also because of the figure in the painting, um, this is nearly as abstract as um, 1808 painting can get, right? I mean, it's, it's essentially an abstract painting, but for that monk. But what I was really thinking about when I was standing in front of your paintings is that I was that monk. Um, and uh, there's, there's a really beautiful art historical literature about that sort of figure, the, the Rukin figure, um, this figure that we see from the back who blocks our view. And then we use our imaginations, our empathy, actually to step into that figure's moment so that then we can traverse the painting. And so I was thinking how beautiful a way that is of thinking about your work, um, that we are able then to step into your moment and then to start to, to swim in your, in your paintings. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't, I can't think of a way to respond to that. It's, um, except to say that, um, you know, my, my aesthetics formed largely in college by reading 19th century poetry. So in English, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think that that notion that, that kind of Edmund Burke notion of the sublime is the, you know, it's sort of like what I grew up on. So it's just going to be there for better, for worse, forever, I think. Um, somehow another artist that comes to mind, <laughs> jumping way forward, is um, Agnes Martin. Mm. Um, I think that your description, I, I, I didn't catch the. Um, I think you just threw out a German term, um, whose meaning I understood, but I didn't catch the term itself. Um, I think of Agnes Martin's paintings a lot when I'm thinking of that sort of phenomenon. Hmm. I don't know why, because I, I think probably because they're so incredibly open. So that makes me feel like the artist when I'm standing in front of one of her paintings. Um, and so, yeah, maybe the monk is like the artist, is like the swimmer. Mm. I, I mean, I definitely think that if we were to go all art historical on it, right, the Rukin figure, of course, is always the artist. Um, you know, the, the, the figure we see from the back is always the person who is facing the canvas, right? And so, um, you know, of course we would think about uh, Vermeer's paintings or um, gosh, I don't even know, um, thinking then about the, the figures who turn towards us, but with their hands raised, right? So that they're painting, um, you know, Michael Freed talks about this with the, the stone cutters um, by Corbet or, or Caravaggio's um, boy bitten by a lizard, you know, he's like, oh, and it's actually him holding the brush. And so it makes perfect sense then that as we stand in front of an Agnes Martin or this painting or your paintings, we're also assuming your place because we have to. Right. The, for some reason, Las Meninas. Um, mm. at, yeah. Um, yeah, what else? What do you I walk mean? back and forth in front of your paintings as you're making them, or do you are you do you have a still practice? Oh. Um, I, I think I. I think I'm either walking or, yeah. I well, I guess I know you're like that, Amanda. I already told you I was swimming. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it would be great to be able to paint while swimming. Um, 
I I guess the best way I can answer that question is a, li a little bit of both or, or neither really. It's the, the most productive way I have of looking at my paintings is peripherally. It's Ooh. like, I, for some reason to, to, to I, I understand what I need to do best when I'm looking at something else. Usually another painting that doesn't, that I don't, really care as much about at that moment um, or something else you know it doesn't doesn't even have to be looking it could be like listening to something the radio or music um, or sometimes reading but I, I generally don't read that much in my studio mm -hmm. um, yeah sometimes writing um, but Usually, I guess what I would say is that I'm very distractible and, and somehow therefore I need to be distracted in order to concentrate on something. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know why, I don't know why. It's sort of like the bane of my existence, but I, after all this time, I'm kind of like, it's, it's been a while now, but I kind of feel uh, okay, okay, I don't struggle with it anymore. Sometimes we need the other noise so that we can focus on what we're doing. Yeah, so I'm finding the noise in many different ways all the time. Mm -hmm. But there's a built-in noise, so I don't have to, I don't have to like look very far. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the oldest of six children. And so when I first oh, wow. um, went to grad school and lived by myself, I couldn't write papers without the TV on because I couldn't concentrate. I, I, it was too quiet in my little studio apartment with just me. And so I constantly had to have the TV on in order to write all of my term papers. So I understand where you're coming from with that. It's weird though, when I write, I need to, I need to be isolated and it's it's totally um, it's torture because I don't I can't write when there's a distraction and mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to be undistracted. So it's I don't know I got to figure something else out with that so I can write more. Do you want to write more? I do. I write on, I, I, I actually never thought of it as writing until someone insisted that it was. I write on these paintings, um, these small paintings every week of the sky. And um, it's just a, a few sentences, um, but there it is like, I got myself to write because I'm, I'm writing on a painting. Um, yeah, I would like to write, maybe I need to get a new iPad where I can like write on the iPad. Because mm, mm -hmm. the iPad that I'm looking at right now doesn't have that function. But this is like a, a, the latest in a long, li long, um, list of like various setups I need in my life to get myself to do something. <laughs> At least you recognize them, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you have to, when you write, do you have to have things just a certain way? Like, do you have to have, do you, do you write longhand or on your computer? I used to write longhand. Um, my master's thesis totally wrote longhand and then typed it out. Um, but now I just use my computer, but everything has to be perfect, right? It has to be clean. Um, the laundry has to be done, all of that stuff. Otherwise, I, I know there are other chores that I have to do. And yeah. So, and you yeah. can, yeah, if there's anything to do, mm -hmm. it's not possible to do the thing that you need to do or want to do. Yeah, but once I'm in it, then I'm just in it. And um, 
that's interesting too. Like other things will be happening around me and I'll have no way of knowing about them because I'm so focused on, on paying attention to myself. So <laughs> good for you. That's great. That's really those um, paintings that you mentioned where you wrote on them, those are of course the paintings of the sky, which um, was the subject of your most recent show until this one at James Cohan, your solo show, I mean. Um, mm -hmm. So you're moving into a, a moment in your career where you're, you're making paintings of things that could be recognizable to your viewer. Um, whereas, in your earlier career, you were um, very, very interested in the monochrome. And so I, I'm curious about that, um, about the, the potential of the monochrome and what it was about that that, that really attracted you to it. Um, I have so many different answers I've given to that question. So the one that arrives in my mind now, um, which I've said before, is that it's an area of aesthetics and of painting that seems to be over uh, overworked or finished. Like, in a certain in a certain art historical narrative, which I I'm not espousing, um, Ad Reinhardt kind of killed it off. So I <clears throat> I really enjoy that challenge of trying to find some more meaning in something that's just been squeezed of its last bit of meaning. Um, and it's really wonderful to find <laughs> that you squeeze really hard and all of a sudden like it, it explodes into something else. Um, so that's probably the main way to answer that for me. Another, another response from something around your question is that, um, I, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought um, about the monochrome. Um, let's see. Yeah, I was just talking about how there's very little room in there, um, but also, um, I, oh, I think that I, this is what I wanted to say. I think that I, um, I do best when I'm observing something instead of just coming up with it from, what's the, cliche from whole cloth. I don't even mm -hmm. know what that means. Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't state it correctly, but you know what I mean? Like these, this painting that we're looking at, you know, it's comprised of lots of little panels where I just looked at someone's, you know, someone's arm and tried to mix oil paint to look, to appear to be a, a very similar color according to my eye. Um, and that's when it works out best. So in other words, these triptychs that I made, if I just made them in my studio with no, with the, th with the idea that they're gonna be triptychs and underwater surface of water sky, but then never went swimming, I don't think they would be very good. Someone else could do that but I can't do that very well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's simply it. That doesn't, that doesn't answer your question. The first part, uh, the, the way I answered it was, was probably um, my best shot at answering that question now, but um, 
it's kind of like um, I'm a still life painter or a landscape painter, um, but I just couldn't do it the regular way, partly because honestly, partly because I, I can't draw very well. So, you know, I was just having a discussion with several people actually about foreground, middle ground, background. And it takes a kind of, in order to do that in a drawing or a painting, it takes, you know, it often takes rendering. Um, and I'm, I'm just not, I keep saying I'm not good at it, but I don't have that much interest in it. I'm sure I could get better at it. I just haven't had much interest in it for some reason. Um, that's why these three separate panels have been useful. Um, Cause it's just, you know, here's this zone and then we go to this zone and then this other zone, which, mm -hmm kind of reminds me of the computer in a way, like different screens. Mm. I, I never thought about it that way till this moment. But um, I mean, the paintings don't look anything like that, I think, but it's slightly related, I think, to screen space. Hmm. I have so many ideas, but I, I guess the thing that I'm most thinking of is, you know, there was that great surrealist quip in the early 20th century about how you could make an all white painting by painting 11 virgins wearing communion dresses in a snowstorm, <laughs> you know, and so, so maybe, maybe that's kind of what you're doing too, you know, is, um, yeah. you know, like you're actually painting something, but it, to, to our uh, uninformed and impatient eyes, it, it looks like a, like a monochrome. Well, the other thing that your your anecdote reminds me of is is that I I never really wanted to make anything too difficult to to for you to apprehend. Um, so it's. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people would say my work is, I mean, I have heard that like people like, you know, people who don't, people who have a, um, a block, like who don't want to, um, who, you know, the type of person who says, I, I don't know anything about art, you know, so this, I don't understand. Um, I really enjoy having that person like trying to I was going to say coax or seduce or lure I don't know which word is is better but to get them to see my work somehow um and so sometimes it's just as simple as you know like seeing it and then knowing a little bit about what it's supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. Like I remember being in a museum with this work in front of a classroom of kindergartners and um, I asked them what they thought it was, kind of like that. And, um, you know, they were like, bathroom tiles and you know lots of a few, well not lots but a few different other things which I can't remember until someone said skin color hmm. um but I think like the slightly roundabout way of getting to that was wonderful and, and useful because it's actually not skin color, it's a piece of wood with some oil and 
dirt on it, like pigment. It's um, synecdoche, this work that we're talking about. I, I told you uh, when we met each other that this is not just one of my favorite works of art. This is one of my favorite works of art to teach. Um, I, because I actually had similar experiences, obviously not standing in front of the work, I was standing in front of a slide, but, you know, asking my students, what is this? And, you know, does it represent anything? And does it not represent something? And um, I was teaching freshmen. And so, of course, the word synecdoche is fresh in their minds because it's an SAT word, you know, and so some of them even remembered what that meant. And then, the way that we actually start to think about how you are using the term here, um, I think it's I think it's replete and um, and is I think a, a particularly beautiful work of art and and I've I've always 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 loved thinking about it um, because it gives you so much back to think about. Yeah, thanks. You know, I made it so incrementally. I didn't really know what it was like to to see all of it mm -hmm. for a lot of it until it was up um because I couldn't do that in my studio very well in other words in my studio back then in the early 90s um maybe I had 20 of them but I, I doubt that I ever bothered to put a hundred of them up I'm I'm sure of it so when I got to see 200 of them I didn't exactly know what it was. Um, and then it wasn't till many years later that I realized that that the, the synecdochal aspect of this work, synecdoche, is something that happens in all of my work somehow. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I'm always just like looking at some Thing right in front of me and trying to say something about it and then that thing has to do with everything um so maybe everybody's work is that way but I just realized you know whenever I make something I turn around and and if I have a chance to get some distance on it I realize oh I'm just doing that same thing again that's what I do I, I think you could do worse than to make something that somehow is about everything and that responds <laughs> to it beautifully. <laughs> yeah. But that reminds me, I was in a group critique once and a colleague of mine who I very much respect um, was commenting on um, the, the artist's work who we were critiquing and said, you can't, you can't make work about the universe. And everybody just kind of nodded for a second. And then I, I was nodding and then, and then I realized, and I, and I said, why not? Why can't you make work about the universe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell that to Dora, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or any number of artists, yeah. Byron, I think I think I'm going to leave it there, thinking about how we can engage with the universe um, through your work and and the paintings and and objects of other artists. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for this generous talk. Amanda, thank you so much for your questions. They were really very very useful. Thank you, Nick. We'll we'll send it back over to you. Uh, well, thank you both. Um, this has been such a beautiful conversation and, and such a privilege to listen to. So um, thank you. But yes, we have quite a few questions. We're going to jump right into it. Um, I am going to first pass the mic over to Patricia. Um, Patricia, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Byron. Hey, Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> this, is this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still here. 
Uh, my <laughs> question was very simple, and, and it goes back to the fact that I was one of the arms uh, for, for, your, for, for your painting. For um, your beyond, too. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask was, because in looking at those wonderful uh, sort of not skin tone, but not skin color, but obviously flesh tone, that, that sort of sense of, of those browns and yellows and stuff. And then looking at the colors you are mostly using in the work that's up now, how has your sense of color changed over the last three decades? Wow. Um... I think the more that I study color just out in the world, somehow the less I know, the less I know about it. Mm. So um, that that's a little bit counter to this other notion that, you know, when I started painting, trying to paint skin color, I didn't I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't particularly good at it. I don't think I was any better at it than any other regular painter. Mm -hmm. um, but I got I got better at it. Um, one thing that I realized embarrassingly recently is that I can perceive and and copy hue really well, like the, the color red, yellow, blue, you know, but I am not very good at, at um, perceiving and copying color value, which is the lightness and darkness of it. <laughs> so, um, so I've, or it's not so much that I was bad at it, but I didn't understand that I wasn't paying at enough attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been paying more attention to it. Um, so I occasionally still do those skin paintings and um, I'm, I think I'm getting better at it. And partly is partly it's because I've developed better method, better technique. Um, and so, um, yeah, I don't know that my, Maybe my sense of color has, I, I'm not sure if that was your question, but my sense of color has changed over the years just because I care about it more. Like huh. I, I realized, you know, whenever it was 20, 25 years ago that I, that that's what I really was interested in. Okay. Um, and I don't know if it was because I was intrinsically, like genuinely interested in it or because I made work that kind of pushed me in that direction. I don't know, but um, I'm more interested in color than anything else. Okay. I'm glad I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Patricia, so much. Thanks for joining today. Um, next, I'm gonna pass the mic over to our friend, G.E. Schwartz. G.E., you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you all so much for this wonderful afternoon. And I love your work, Brian. Um, you. Did you see your work adding as a lot of great other works of art, like novels and things like that? Do you see them adding energy to the world? I, I, I hope so. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I would just say yes, because it's this inert thing. In my case, it's this inert thing that's not actually literally adding energy to the world, but between the painting and the viewer, something happens and that is almost undeniably um, a production of energy. So yes, that's my one word answer to your question. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Chi. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic to my comrade, Ty. Ty, over to you. Hi, Byron. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for this talk today. I was 
I'm sure bothering Nick in our in our Slack channel, just um, sort of virtually yelling about how excited I was about the work. And um, <laughs> the two things I like am always thinking about the most are um, space and swimming. So uh, was really just very excited. Um, but by space, do you mean outer space? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. I just realized recently that. Um, it's good enough to be in the deep water because I'll never get to outer space. A friend just told me about some competition to go to outer space, but yeah, they won't I didn't know them. about it. So I'm, I'm not on social media, so I missed the deadline. Plus, I'm sure there's lots of reasons why they wouldn't have accepted me. They have a lot of rules about like how mentally well you have to be and all. Not that that excludes you, it just <laughs> Me. It probably <laughs> does actually, because it would take, yeah, I don't know. Um, if you could just do it in an afternoon, probably. That's my theory as well. But um, yeah. uh, I also think about deep water as, as about as close to space as we can get. Um, but something I was wondering about specifically, and uh, when you're talking about color, is how uh, like the human narration of color in both um, Earth and outer space uh, sort of feels connected to your work to me. Um, I was in the chat talking about when looking at Solaris, I was thinking about um, the the first the first color image of Mars, which was um, like, I don't know if you've seen it hand colored by scientists um, because they were like waiting for the code to print. Um, and the colors are like this, these crazy reds that are all just like hand like sketched. Um, and they're really wild. And then I was also thinking about when looking at um, Synecdoche, the like average color of the universe, which is like this really like sort of basic beige um, that some insane person named Cosmic Latte. But I was wondering what you what you thought about like, yeah, hue of color um, in outer space and and in water. I have no idea what color in outer, outer space me, even means, and, and certainly the average color in the universe, because like the color of Mars that those scientists were inferring um, when they were trying to sketch it out, at least has as its illumination source the same sun, the same star as, as what as our, but then it's there's a different atmosphere. And so that would change things, but at least it's the same light source. So like the same chemicals are burning to make that color of light, but other stars are made of different, are, are made of different, have different composition. And so they're burning a different color. Um, and then all the different things that are out there in the universe are made of different things. And, and um, for the most part, we are familiar with, I guess we think that we're familiar with all these, what all the different elemental components are, but um, it's way too much for my small brain. Although it's exactly the kind of thing that I, I once in a while like to, wonder about um like what would what would it even be like to see i mean one basic question i have is the um, blue inflected be, because of our particular atmosphere well i just I just would like to know what um, what a particular what a blue color if I if I saw something if I see some blue th thing here what would it look like if, it, if I could see it outside of our atmosphere but with the same sun like you know if I were outside of a spaceship just orbiting the Earth. I don't think people talk about that kind of thing too much. There's this um, there's this episode of Radiolab from 2012 um, that I'm, I'll drop in the chat in a moment, but 
they have uh, just really crazy meditations on blue and uh, the amount of cones that different species have to see light with and see color with. Um, and it, it just absolutely blew my mind wide open when I first, when I first heard yeah, it. Yeah, that's a great episode. I think that's the episode where this psychologist um, decides not to tell his daughter what the color of the sky is. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, so that she could decide on her own. And he asks her every day and she says white every day until uh, at one point she says blue. And she probably says blue because she picked it up somewhere else. I'm guessing, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense to call that, call the sky white because it's the, it's the lightest. I mean, by definition, it's the lightest part of our environment. They also, I think, talk about the Odyssey in that episode. And about oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, about all the, I don't know, it's this weird thing. Every, every few years you see an article about how supposing that the ancient Greeks physically perceived things differently, which is clearly not true. They just had different way of talking about color. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ty, and thank you, Byron. I think this is a, a really wonderful place to kind of um, include on. I, I'd like to read Annette in the chat said, thanks so much for this conversation. Humility and epiphany and essence braided together. So I think that's very well spoken. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining and for um, sharing your wonderful thoughts and questions and ruminations in the chat. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, but here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. So I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Shang Yang Feng, to the stage. Poet Shang Yang Feng comes from Chengdu, China, a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. He is the author of the poetry collection, Burying the Mountain, available from uh, Copper Canyon Press from last year. Um, without further ado, uh, passing the mic over to you, Shang Yang. Hello. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Byron and Amanda. It's such an inspiring conversation. Um, writers are always, always inspired by artists and their artworks. Um, in fact, the, the two poems I'm going to read, I'm going to read two poems. The first one uh, is in the tradition of ekphrastic poetry, which is to write a poem in response to artwork. And um, this poem I wrote, um, before my 25th, the one day before my 25th birthday, I was at the Boston Museum of Fine Art and I walked into one room and was just transfixed by a painting by Anthony Van Dyke. And it is the painting called Daedalus and Icarus. And I didn't remember how long I stood there looking at Daedalus tying a thread on, the, on Icarus back. Um, and it is such, a theme, a subject that's being explored in poetry with great writings on the same subject by W.H. Auden, William Carlos Williams. Um, but then I thought it was my birthday, I'd like to give it a try. So I wrote this poem uh, to indulge myself. Um, it's called Foretaste of Disaster. Young, therefore vain and wingless, he lets his father tie a blue thread around his chest. It is before the famous tragedy, the fall, before the imminent sea. The coast still composed in subdued hues and regimented patterns. The abstraction of waves has yet to be mutilated by a scream. Human position yet to be tested. He, at his prime, Anthony Van Dyke, blazing like an overripe Flemish peach presented this self-portrait in which an old man tethers a wing to a young man's pale, well-knit back. Here, grief 
has yet to become visible, as in Bruegel's stick out of the water, legs white as boiled chicken. In his early 20s, Icarus, the trespasser or cross-dresser, was punished for his pride. In his early 20s, Van Dyke portrayed himself as Icarus in a painting in front of which I stand, looking him in the eyes. Tomorrow, I'll be a quarter of a century old. My father disappeared like an antelope into the dawning gold. But if and when Icarus survives his drowning, stepping out of the sea as if out of a Kavafi poem, dripping with synonyms of passion and desire, who will untie the blue thread from his chest? Who will save me? Come to change my life. The second poem, um, that poem was from my first book, uh, Bearing the Mountain. The second poem I'm going to read um, is a new poem I just wrote uh, two weeks ago. It's called Autobiography. Many apricots ago, I was a child. The world had yet to enter me. My body, small, consuming limited space, limited materials, meaning the world and I, we owed each other so little. Evenings, my mother bent over the sink, imitating the faucet. I measured those days by the decay of each apricot, the pits, permanent, I supposed, were the shapes of all sorrow. My black hair, thick and oily, my hands grew large, becoming tools for other hands that opened me like a door. The world entered as a famished cat. I fed it with my inside, standing at my grandmother's funeral, the air tasting granular. I thought I could cry for the rest of my life. I grew consuming baskets of fruits, perceiving the mortal aspect of them, their use, meaning I am human now, demonstrating the passage of time with my body, then with the understanding of my body in relation to others. I only recognized that sex is designed to be good. The apricots acknowledge that, closing themselves in June rain into complete mysteries. I sit on the balcony most days, watching rain when it is raining, waiting when it is not. I can barely tell imagination from reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean Young. I, I was clapping and I didn't turn on my microphone. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing your poems with, with us today. That was a beautiful way to conclude a really beautiful conversation. Thank you both Byron and Amanda. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, Catherine, Emily, Sarah, and the extended team at the James Cohen Gallery for helping to make today's event possible. And I encourage everyone, if you are able to, to visit Byron Kim, Drawn to Water, on view at James Cohen through February 19th of this year. Uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And join us on Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation with artist Joan Semmel, joining art historian Amelia Jones on the occasion of Semmel's exhibition, Skin in the Game at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, I wanna thank you all again and wish you all a very happy weekend. And you can all now turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, 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 Wonderful poems. Thank you, so much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Happy weekend. Likewise, likewise. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Byron. Bye.